The ocean appears to stretch on forever, as a mass of endless blue. But when you dip your head below the surface, you may find a hidden treasure, a coral reef. These natural wonders are sometimes called the rainforests of the ocean because of their radiant colors and biodiversity. Reefs are a type of ecosystem inhabited by coral, fish, and various other types of marine wildlife. Reefs cover less than 1% of the Earth's surface, yet they are one of the most diverse ecosystems. Despite this small percentage, Australia's Great Barrier Reef is visible from space. An estimated 25% of the fish in the ocean rely on coral reefs in some way, either for food or laying their eggs among the branches of coral, whose skeletal bodies are the structure of a reef. Coral also has a mutualistic relationship with the type of algae that grows on it. This algae, called zooxanthellae, benefits from a protected habitat within the coral in the shallow water where it can photosynthesize. Coral also benefits from the relationship because the algae produces oxygen and carbohydrates for the coral's use. This is just one simple example of the many relationships and interconnected food webs that exist in a coral reef. However, reefs are more than just an ecosystem for plants and animals. They are also an important part of the sedimentary process. They are largely influenced by the organisms that grow there. Calcium carbonate minerals, or aragonite and calcite, are extremely prominent in these environments. Aragonite is produced by organisms such as coral, pteropods, which are a type of plankton, also called sea butterflies, clams, snails, and cephalopods, and some mollusks. Calcite, on the other hand, is primarily made by brachiopods, echinoderms, oysters, trilobites, stromatoporoids, some extinct types of corals, and coralline algae. The construction of reefs is largely due to biomineralization. Biomineralization is just what it sounds like, the creation of minerals by organisms. There are two types of biomineralization, enzymatic and non-enzymatic. Enzymatic biomineralization is when organisms control and intend to build minerals. An example of this is coral building its skeletal structure. Non-enzymatic biomineralization is a byproduct of another biological process, such as digestion. From the Cambrian to early Ordovician, reefs were built by organisms called stromatolites and archaeocyathids. Stromatolites are flat microbial beds that can build up over time, forming small mounds. These mounds are found throughout the fossil record. Archaeocyathids are small, calcareous sponges that would group together and form reefs that are also visible in the fossil record. Reefs have many parts, but they can be summed up in a few general terms. The deep fore reef is the edge of the reef that drops off into the open ocean. The fore reef is the flatter area where the waves break. The reef crest is a shallow part of the reef. This area can be above the water at times. The back reef slopes down into the lagoon, which is a calmer area that generally has few waves breaking. Not only are there different parts to a reef, there are also different types of reefs themselves. Barrier reefs are the largest type of reef and may extend hundreds of miles along a coast and into the ocean. They create a lagoon between the shore and the reef crest. Fringing reefs are characterized by being closer to the shore. Some lie directly on the shore and have no lagoon at all. If there is a lagoon present, it is generally very small and shallow. Atolls are a type of reef that are ring-shaped. They don't occur directly along the coastline. They create almost a circle that encloses a large lagoon in the center of the reef. They are often described as donut-shaped reefs. They form in a unique way. A volcano builds up over time and a reef forms around it. The volcano is then subducted, leaving the reef around it. For this reason, the reefs often have layers of limestone and volcanic rock. Patch reefs, also called table or pinnacle reefs, are just like their name sounds. They are small patches of coral that occur on a shelf and may not display all parts of the reef like a lagoon. Patch reefs can be quite small, although it is common for them to grow in the vicinity of a larger, more prominent reef. 
Most fringing and barrier reefs have patch reefs around them. Other notable ancient calcareous structures include bioherms and biostromes. A bioherm is a mound-like structure of organic material amounting from a rock of different lithology. A biostrome is a flatter bed-like structure that is layered beds of shells, crinoids, or coral created by sedentary organisms. Unlike a bioherm, biostromes do not swell up into a mound. Both of these features are preserved as limestone. You can see here the layers of the biostrome. Banks or shoals are inorganic reef-like structures. They can be made of carbonate or oolitic material and undergo weathering from waves. However, they differ greatly from tropical reefs as they lack the organisms to maintain the biodiversity and biomineralization processes. They tend to be deposited from water, such as a flowing river or stream. Since they can have a long bank-like structure, sometimes they can block waves similar to a reef in its lagoon. But without living organisms, they don't experience biomineralization and bioerosion. Deepwater reefs can form in colder waters in the north, such as around Norway. They grow extremely slowly, only between 5 to 25 millimeters per year. Since they grow in deep, cold water, they can't rely on the mutualistic relationship with zooxanthellae to get the proper nutrients they need to grow their skeletons. Instead, they have larger than average polyps, or the branch-like living part of the coral. They use these polyps to extract food from the water. For this reason, they prefer areas with a current that will bring food to them. Deepwater reefs are also closely intertwined with glaciers, and some have alternating depositional layers of glacial deposits and limestone from reefs because they occur in the north where glaciers are prominent. Some of the main lithophases that can be found in reef environments are coral, ooids, grapestone, and mud or mud pellets. The first is corogal lithophases. As I mentioned before, calcium carbonate is largely present in reefs. This is due to the organisms in the habitat that create calcite and aragonite shells and body structures. We refer to this collection of sediment as corogal lithophases. The next set of lithophases are ooids. Ooids are small, extremely spherical grains made mostly of calcium carbonate layers. They may have a nucleus that the calcium carbonate forms around, such as a bioclast. Coral reefs are the perfect environment for the formation of ooids. They have plenty of bioclasts to form around, and the waves in the ocean help to create round ooids. Grapestones are also present. Grapestones are aggregates of grains cemented on the seafloor by macritic aragonite. They generally form in water that is 9 meters or deeper. This could include a lagoon of a bigger reef. Behind the high energy 4 reef, many sediment deposits accumulate in the lagoon. These include peloids, pellet mud, foraminiferal sands, and corogal sands made of corals and calcareous algae. All of this sediment can build up and cover the bottom of the lagoon. The larger particles tend to be closer to the reef or farther out to sea, and the finer material is closer to the shore. This mud can build up over time and create layers. Symmetrical ripples can be found in reefs as well as the back and forth motion of waves creates this structure. However, reefs are different from beach environments. Even fringing reefs that are close to shore, they tend to block waves and lagoons have very still waters. So there are not as many ripple structures present here as a beach environment might have. It may come as a surprise, but not all reefs are located in tropical regions full of coral and fish. There are freshwater reefs like in Lake Michigan. These reefs are quite different from the ones we are used to seeing. The reefs are larger piles of rock that are 6 to 10 feet high and are made of rocks that are about the size of a softball. They are important for fish, particularly trout, because they lay their eggs on them. 
The flow of the current keeps the eggs oxygenated and allows them to grow. Invasive species like the freshwater goby occupy Lake Michigan and eat the eggs of the trout. Many of these freshwater reefs are human-made to try and preserve the trout population by providing them a place to lay their eggs. Unfortunately, like so many parts of the natural world, human action is causing dramatic changes and damages for these ecosystems. Coral evolved to live in the alkaline ocean. However, in recent years, the alkaline nature of the ocean is slowly changing. Humans release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere through the burning of fossil fuels. Because the concentration in the air is increasing, more and more of the carbon dioxide dissolves into the ocean. Carbonic acid forms in the ocean when CO2 and H2O bond together. This acid, in return, lowers the pH of the ocean. As humans release more and more CO2 from the burning of fossil fuels, the ocean is becoming more and more acidic. This creates an environment that is more difficult for the coral to grow their skeletal structure. Ocean acidification is tied to a decline in the production of coral. It can also dissolve some of the calcium carbonate structures over time. Another threat to the growth of coral is the rising ocean temperature. Coral rely on their mutualistic relationship with zooxanthellae. Even a, a change as small as 2 degrees Fahrenheit stresses coral, causing them to expel zooxanthellae from their skeletons. Without it, the coral loses its color and the mutualistic relationship is destroyed. Here you can see that the colorful aspects of the reef are not really the coral themselves, but the zooxanthellae that grows on them. Acidification and bleaching aren't the only things that inhibits reef growth. Sediment itself can have negative impacts on reefs. When runoff from rain and floods flow into rivers, it brings sediment with it. This sediment travels downstream and eventually reaches the ocean where it can stay suspended in the water around reefs. This sediment creates brown flood blooms, or more simply put, cloudy water. Coral reefs rely on sunlight to grow because of their zooxanthellae. So when the water becomes cloudy, it blocks the sunlight. This leads to less expansion in coral reefs. So where does the sediment come from and why is it becoming a bigger problem now? Scientists believe it has to do with humans. When people build houses, towns, and start farming, they till the land and create more loose sediment. As they cut down trees, their roots can't hold the soil together. This loosened sediment combined with increasingly unpredictable weather due to climate change allows for more storms, floods, and therefore runoff to accumulate in the ocean. Reefs are not directly related to plate tectonics as tropical reefs tend to be in shallow, well-lit water and are not associated with fault lines. However, they still can impact them. In Cahuito Park in Costa Rica, a 1991 earthquake caused disruption in the terrain and lifted a large section of the reef 10 meters upward. Part of the reef was exposed above the surface and it dried up very quickly. Restoration was needed from the park afterwards because of the intense amount of damage done to the reef. Another similar event happened in the Solomon Islands. Events like these are uncommon though. Reefs largely remain in situ or in place. They don't move a lot over time. The list of threats to reefs goes on, including overfishing of endangered species, drilling fragments disturbing their growth, overexploitation of coral for jewelry, and pollution from tsunamis. There's even the risk of tourists taking home pieces of reefs when they go scuba diving or snorkeling around them. Some even carve their names into the reefs. Coral reefs are an intricate ecosystem and sedimentary depositional system tied into one. 
Their influence on the Earth is strong, despite the fact that they do not cover much of the surface. With the continued decline of reefs, it is hard to say how the world will be without their wondrous presence.